Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the weekly chart of the Dow 30. And, of course, the big question on everybody's mind, as well as on my mind, is, is this going to be a repeat of Black Monday? Now, there are a lot of factors that line up with Black Monday, 1987, but then there are other factors that don't. Uh, for those of you who recall, and we're going to do a review of, of people who were trading at that time from Market Wizards. For those of you who recall, uh, basically the market was drifting lower. It went down significantly on that Thursday. Friday it went down very hard. And closing on the lows is also very important. You can see we closed on the lows. Anytime you see a market that closes on the lows, there's a danger there. Uh, because it just means that uh, they were selling right into the close. They couldn't get out uh, in time. And uh, those can be followed by a gap down. Now, the first thing we want to look at is the Wikipedia entry on Black Monday. And uh, read this real quick. In finance, Black Monday refers to Monday, October 19th, 1987, when stock markets around the world crashed, shedding a huge value in a very short time. The crash began in Hong Kong and spread west to Europe, hitting the United States after other markets had already declined by a significant margin. The Dow Jones Industrial Average fell exactly 508 points to 1738.74, a 22.61% decline. So, that's the percentage decline. Now, if you pull that up and do the math on today's market, that percentage decline from Friday's close bring, uh, gives us a 3,721 point decline. And that decline I've marked here on the chart. So if we get something comparable to the Black Monday crash, and it actually went lower than that, subsequently but bounced and and then uh, for those of you who don't know the history the plunge protection team with alan greenspan was instituted it was actually the beginning of very different markets than we had had previously but the point is that this is where we will be at the close on monday well we won't be necessarily necessarily there but that will be the low that we hit uh, coming on monday we will hit around 12,750 or so if we get a mirror of the 1987 Black Monday decline. Now let's look at a chart of this. This is a daily chart of the Black Monday decline. And you can see you had a sell-off uh, preceding it. The high was actually 2750 the low was 16 something. So a thousand point decline from top to bottom. Uh, are, are the two comparable? Um, not really. From looking at the charts, we're actually closer to uh, in here. So it's quite possible that we could actually get a big down day and then the crash um, but so we can't say for certain but you can see what happened now Black Monday uh, the Thursday is this candlestick here Friday is this candlestick and Monday is this candlestick you can see on Tuesday they actually made a lower price uh, with huge volatility now we know the VIX hit a record and uh, there's all kinds of crazy stories going on out there. You can go to Zero Hedge and look at how uh, Susie Orman has called for the Fed to intervene and all kinds of crazy stuff. But what we really want to look at is the history of Black Monday and uh, what happened. Uh, so let's go to Market Wizards. That is the history of the traders. Now I've isolated three interviews with uh, traders. That's uh, Paul Tudor Jones, Marty Schwartz, and Jimmy Rogers. 
and uh, I just want to read these for a historical perspective uh, of what they were talking about at the time and these are guys who lived through and traded through those markets so we'll start off with Paul Tudor Jones and uh, this is the interview with him you did extraordinarily well during October 1987 a month which was a disaster for many other traders could you fill us in on some of the details the week of the crash was one of the most exciting periods of my life. We had been expecting a major stock market collapse since mid-1986 and had contingency plans drawn up because of the possibility we foresaw a financial meltdown. When we came in on Monday, October 19th, we knew that the market was going to crash that day. What made you so sure? Because the previous Friday was a record volume day on the downside. So I want to look at that real quick here uh, record volume down day and we want to see if we have a uh, analogy to that now it turns out we really don't have that this is market watch and this is you can see the volume comes in at 225.17 million and that's gonna put us here now whether that's a record on the downside, I don't know, but it's certainly not a record volume. Now, the other factor that you have to take into consideration here is that the market nowadays is mainly algos. And so the volume in the Dow has been declining significantly as mainstream, Main Street investors have abandoned the stock market. That's been a pattern that Zero Hedge has documented for a long time. It actually started right here with what I call the Obama bottom. And, and you can see the continuous downtrend in volume. So yes, this spike is a big spike. So I would say that's about a 70% correlation with this statement that we had a record volume day on the downside. We did close on the low. The exact same thing happened in 1929, two days before the crash. Our analog model to 1929 had the collapse perfectly nailed. Paul Jones analog model developed by his research director, Peter Borish, superimposed the 1980s market over the 1920s market. The two markets demonstrated a remarkable degree of correlation. This model was a key tool in Jones's stock index trading during 1987. Treasury Secretary Baker's weekend statement that the U.S. would no longer support the dollar because of its disagreements with West Germany was the kiss of death for the market. So there's an interesting analogy. They had a Treasury official come out and say that they would no longer support the dollar. Now, how is that analogous? Well, it's not really analogous. We haven't had an announcement, but we did have the Chinese devalue and some conspiracy tinfoil hat people would argue that the America retaliated by bombing Beijing's main port and then uh, China backed off on that but then we saw a surprising decline in the dollar so is that analogous maybe when did you cover your short position we actually covered our shorts and went somewhat long on the close of the day of the crash itself October 19th were most of your profits in October due to your short stock index position no we also had an extremely profitable bond position. The day of the crash, we put on the biggest bond position we ever had. The bond market had been acting terrible all day long. On October 19th, during the day, I was very concerned about the financial safety of our clients and our own assets. We had our assets with various commission houses on the street, and I thought those funds could be in jeopardy. It was an intolerable situation for me. I kept on thinking, what is the Fed reaction going to be? I thought that they would have to add massive amounts of liquidity to create a very rosy environment instantaneously. However, since bonds had been acting poorly all day, I couldn't bring myself to pull the trigger on a long bond position. During the last half hour of trading, bonds suddenly started to turn up and it clicked in my mind that the Fed was going to take actions that would create a tremendous upsurge in bond prices. As soon as I saw the bond market act right for a moment, I went wild. Do you believe that October 1987 was an early warning signal of more negative times ahead? 
I think the financial community, particularly Wall Street, was dealt a life-threatening blow on October 19th, but they are in shock and don't realize it. I remember the time I got run over by a boat and my backside was chewed up by the propeller. My first thought was, dang it, I just ruined my Sunday afternoon because I've got to get stitched up because I was in shock. I didn't even realize how badly cut up I was until I saw the faces of my friends. Everything gets destroyed a hundred times faster than it is built up. It takes one day to tear down something that might have taken 10 years to build. If the economy starts to go with the kind of leverage that is in it, it will deteriorate so fast that people's heads will spin. I hate to believe it, but in my gut, that is what I think is going to happen. I know from studying history that credit eventually kills all great societies. We have essentially taken out our American Express card and said we are going to have a great time. Reagan made sure that the economy would be great during his term in office by borrowing our way into prosperity. We borrowed against the future and soon we will have to pay. That's very interesting that he cites Reagan there. And I don't completely disagree uh, because that was when the debt started to explode. But look at the comments here and compare the numbers that we're at today. Are you blaming the current situation on Reaganomics? I think Reagan made us feel good as a country and that is wonderful, but in terms of economics, he was the biggest disaster that ever struck. I think he basically hoodwinked us by promising to cut the deficit and then went on the biggest spending binge in the history of this country. I don't think a Democrat could have gotten away with it because everyone would have been vigilant about 150 to $180 billion deficit. Now, you know we're running nearly... I believe actually, but I don't. I can't prove it because they've actually locked up the numbers. I think we're still around 800 billion to a trillion dollar deficit, so at least five to ten times the size of that. And he asked, "Do you see any way in which we can solve our current problems before we go into a deep recession or even depression?" That is what scares me so much. I don't see any blueprint out of our current dilemma. Maybe there are macroeconomic forces at work that are part of a larger super cycle that we don't have any control over. Perhaps we are simply responding to the same type of cycles that most advanced civilizations fall prey to, whether it's the Romans, 16th century Spain, 18th century France, or 19th century Britain. I think that we are going to be in for a period of pain. We're going to relearn what financial discipline is all about. So very interesting. That's the interview with Paul Tudor Jones. Now let's move to the next interview. It's uh, Marty Schwartz on page 129. This is another trader who actually traded through the collapse. And he asked him, what was your experience during the week of the October 19th stock crash? I came in long. I have thought about it and I would do the same thing again. Why? Because on October 16th, the market fell 108 points, which at the time was the biggest one day point decline in the history of the stock exchange. It looked climactic to me and I thought that was a buying opportunity. The only problem was that it was a Friday. Usually a down Friday is followed by a down Monday. I don't think Monday would have been nearly as bad as it was if Treasury Secretary James Baker had not started verbally bludgeoning the Germans about interest rates over the weekend. He was so belligerent. Once I heard Baker, I knew I was dead. So you knew that you were in trouble over the weekend. Yes, also Marty Zweig, who's a friend of mine, was on Wall Street Week on Friday evening talking about a possible depression I called Marty the next day and he said he thought there was another 500 points of risk in the market. Of course, he didn't know it was going to happen in one day. What made him so bearish at the time? I think his monetary indicators were terribly negative. Remember the bonds were seeking rapidly at the time. Now, let me comment on this here. Marty Zweig, uh, he, most people don't know who he is today, but he was very, very famous in the 90s. Uh, Marty Zweig uh, wrote uh, a number of stock trading books that did very well and uh, he had a couple of statements that have stuck with us to this day 
And uh, the first one, of course, that he's famous for is don't fight the Fed. Uh, when the Fed is lowering interest rates, uh, don't short stocks. And, and the other one is um, three steps and a stumble. And uh, I think that might have been William, uh, another stock trader, but that's another commonly used saying today. Three, uh, three steps and a stumble. And what that means is when the Fed raises interest rates three times, the stock market's going to stumble on that third rise. Mm -hmm. So how does that apply today? Well, that's very interesting because uh, how can you look at don't fight the Fed? Well, the Fed has said they're going to raise interest rates, but they're at zero. So they can't go any lower. So that's kind of an unprecedented situation. Uh, and then the three steps and a stumble, well, we haven't had any steps, but the rumor is of the first step. So that would line up and say, looking at that traditional Marty Zweig type of analysis, that we will actually get a huge rally on Monday. Um, and continuing. What happened that Monday? When did you get out? The high in the S&P on Monday was 269. I liquidated my long position at 267.2. I was real proud because it was very hard to pull the trigger on a loser. I just dumped everything. I think I was long 40 contracts coming into that day and lost $315,000. One of the most suicidal tilings you can do is in trading is to keep adding to a losing position. Had I done that, I could have lost $5 million on that day. It was painful and I was bleeding, but I honored my risk points and bit the bullet. That's another example where my marine training came into play. They teach you never to freeze when you are under attack. One of the tactics of the Marine Corps officer's manual is either go forward or backward. Don't just sit there if you're getting the hell beat out of you. Even retreating is offensive because you're still doing something. It is the same in the market. The most important thing is to keep enough powder to make your comeback. I did real well after October 19th. In fact, 1987 was my most profitable year. You liquidated your long position very well on October 19th. Did you think about actually going short? I thought about it, but I said to myself, now is not the time to worry about making money. It is the time to worry about keeping what you have made. Whenever there is a really rough period, I try to play defense, defense, defense. I believe in protecting what you have. The day of the crash, I got out of most of my positions and protected my family. Then at 1.30 p.m. with the Dow down 275, I went to my safe deposit box and took my gold out. Half an hour later, I went to another bank and started writing checks to get my cash out. I started buying treasury bills and preparing for the worst. I had never seen anything like what was going on. You were seriously worried about the banks going under? Why not? The stories I heard subsequently from people on the operations side of the business would have stopped the hearts of the public if they had known what was going on. The banks weren't meeting any of the calls at the brokerage firms. On Tuesday morning, we were within hours of the whole thing totally collapsing, so my caution was well advised. I think my fear of a depression is related to my father graduating college in 1929. If you talk to people who got out of college at that time, it is as though a 10-year period is missing from their lives. There was just nothing substantial going on in this country. That always stuck with me. So that's the interview with um, uh, Marty Schwartz. So let's go to the interview with Jimmy Rogers. And as you all know, he's one of my heroes. Uh, fantastic fundamental trader and uh, they ask him so just because the market doesn't respond to some important news such as the October 1979 change in Fed policy doesn't mean that it isn't important all the better if the market keeps going the way it shouldn't go especially if it is a hysterical blow-off then you know an opportunity will present itself can you think of a more recent example yes October 1987. October 19th is my birthday, by the way. At the end of 1986 and the beginning of 1987, I had predicted that we would have one more big move up in the stock market and then witness 
the worst bear market since 1937. But I didn't know I was going to have it. I didn't know it was going to happen on my birthday. It was the best birthday present I ever had. Did you have any idea that the break could be as large as it was? When John Train interviewed me on January 1987, I told him somewhere along the line, the market is going to go down 300 points in one day. He looked at me as though I were a madman. I envisioned that the Dow would be around 3,000 and 300 points would be about 10%. In 1929, the market went down 12% in one day. 10% in one day was not such a big move given the kind of markets we were having then. The market had already seen a number of 3, 4, and 5% days. So I said, why can't the market go down 300 points in a day? Little did I know it would be 508 points. Why did you pick 1937 as a comparison in your prediction for a stock market collapse? Because in 1937, the Dow went down 49% in six months. What I was trying to say was that we were going to have a major, fast, deep, horrible collapse, as opposed to say 1973, 1974, when the market went down 50%, but it took two years. Why did you use 1937 as an analogy as opposed to 1929-1930? Because 1929-1930 went on to be a major depression. I knew we were going to have a bear market caused by a major financial collapse. I was not convinced we were going to have a depression. I was differentiating between a financial and economic collapse. Why were you expecting a financial collapse? It was the atmosphere. Money was flooding the world. Every stock market in the world was at an all-time high. You had all these stories of young guys three years out of school making half a million dollars a year. That is not reality. Whenever you see that in a market, you are near a top. So I went into the summer position for a collapse. Were you short stocks or long puts? I was short stocks and short calls. I don't buy options. Buying options is another fast way to the poorhouse, etc. When did you cover your positions? During the week of October 19th. If you remember by that time, everybody thought the financial structure of America was over. Did you cover then because we had hysteric, hysteria going the other way? That's exactly right. That week was a textbook case of hysteria. Under those kinds of conditions, if you are still solvent, you have to step in there and go against it. Maybe that was going to be one time Maybe that was going to be the one time it was the end of the world and I would have been wiped out too. But 95% of the time when you go against that kind of hysteria, you're going to make money. And we'll skip down. A lot of people blame the October 1987 break on program trading. Do you consider that scapegoatism? Absolutely. The people who blame it on that do not understand the market. Politicians and people who lose money always look for scapegoats. In 1929, they blamed the crash on short sellers and margin requirements. There were lots of good reasons why the stock market went down. What they should focus on is why there were sellers on October 19th, but no buyers. I remember why I became even more bearish on the weekend before October 19th. The week before, Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan announced that the balance of trade was getting much better and things were under control. Two days later, the balance of trade figures came out and they were the worst in the history of the world. Right away I said, this guy is either a fool or a liar. He doesn't have any idea what is going on. Then on the weekend before October 19th, you had Treasury Secretary Baker telling the world, we're going to stick it to the Germans by letting the dollar go because the Germans weren't loosening monetary and fiscal policy as Baker had demanded. It looked like a trade wars of the 1930s all over again. I was in a panic. I was already short. I called Singapore that Sunday night to add to my shorts. Singapore opens earlier than we do. So all those guys who came in on Monday to sell had very good reasons to sell and there were no buyers around. There were no buyers because there was no reason for people to buy. Even the buyers were scared and bearish that Monday. And it goes on. I encourage you to read that, uh, one of the greatest interviews of Jimmy Rogers uh, that you could ever read. So that's very interesting. He cites the balance of trade figures. Now we know that the balance of trade figures are horrific right now. They're like the worst that we've ever seen. 
We also know that he's citing that Greenspan basically lied. Uh, well, that's what we've kind of got with Janet Yellen telling us she's going to raise interest rates. I don't know how she's possibly going to do that. And then we have this Baker uh, fighting a currency war with another country. Well, look what's happened with China. So there are some analogies that work. There are other analogies that don't work. Uh, I have to tell you right now, I don't have a horse in this race. Uh, let me give you my breakdown. Uh, I went ahead and did a calculation of where I'm at right now. Uh, this is where I'm at. I'm 77% invested in silver. Uh, gold is negligible, really, so we'll just call it silver. I'm 17% in cash, and I'm 6% in crypto. So that's the breakdown of my current portfolio. Uh, I will say no. I, I do have a number of accounts with Forex traders. I have accounts with stock brokers. Uh, I have virtually nothing in those accounts. I didn't bet anything on this decline. Uh, I don't have anything in those accounts. And the reason why is because if I'm right that uh, this is going to collapse, I probably am about 50-50 that we're going to get a Black Monday. But if I'm right that this is going to collapse, then I, I really don't think that I will be able to collect my profits out of the um, stock accounts or futures accounts. They'll probably go MF Global. Certainly, if we get that kind of a decline and then we keep declining, at some point they shut things down and you can't get your money out. So I'm feeling very comfortable being the vast majority in physical silver, some cash, and the rest in cryptocurrencies. Uh, are we going to get that Black Monday? I don't know. It's going to be exciting. We'll just wait and see, and we'll talk to you next time.